I like aldehyde and ketone chemistry. Okay, so we left off here. Um, I just kind of introduced the idea to you of this compound called a cyanohydrin. It says here if you take a carbonyl compound, aldehyde or ketone, and you treat it with hydrocyanic acid, it makes this thing called a cyanohydrin, and it's a reversible reaction. And notice that the cyanohydrin is a carbon that has both a hydroxyl and a nitrile on the same carbon, okay? And um, there was a guy named Arthur Lapworth, I think, that did a whole bunch of research on the formation of cyanohydrins. And he discovered that the reaction works better if you use a catalytic amount of base, because then it makes a little bit of cyanide. So the HCN would get deprotonated by the base, right, to give you a little bit of cyanide ions, right, because it's just a catalytic amount of base. And then, of course, you'd end up with uh, the conjugate base of H base, you know, plus whatever. That's neither here nor there, but um, so you have a little bit of cyanide ions, and so those can act as a nucleophile, and then you can just do a proton transfer with the remaining HCN uh, in the reaction. And it says you don't even have to do an acidic workup because HCN serves as your source of protons. The only problem with this reaction, I would say, is a really big one, and that is working with HCN. Okay, HCN is a liquid at, I think it's got a boiling point that's like 26 or 27 degrees Celsius. So it's really nasty to work with and it's very poisonous. And so, you know, um, somebody came along and said, well, we can spruce up the conditions by using potassium cyanide and HCN. And that way there's more cyanide than protons and they got good yields. Um, and, you know, even here they made a new chiral center and that's all well and good. But to me, I don't, I'm still not a fan of these conditions. Why? Because it involves HCN. And like I told you, HCN is very difficult to work with. And so the best, and it's not even written here in the notes, the best way to do this reaction, I'm going to scribble it up here. So if you could write this down, I would appreciate it. And this is in your textbook. The best way, best, we'll put best method is to do the following. Just kind of zoom in here. Is to take your carbonyl compound, and to treat it instead of potassium cyanide and HCN, to treat it with potassium cyanide and HCl, right? Because then you don't have any of that HCN to worry about. And then that way you can make your cyanohydrin and it's much safer, a okay, much safer way to do it over here, safer. All right. And like I said, we're, cyanohydrins are going to come up even more in chapter 20 because in chapter 20, um, we're going to discuss both of these mechanisms here. So the first one is taking your cyanohydrin. So this is your cyanohydrin. Okay, they just drew out the whole Lewis structure of the nitrile. And if we do a reduction of this using lithium aluminum hydride, that will make a primary amine. So we convert this into a primary amine. And if you take it and you heat it up with aqueous acid, it converts it into a carboxyl group. So you make a carboxylic acid. And again, uh, there's going to be more on this in chapter 20. So all you really need to know so far are these reactions. We're not going to look at the mechanisms at all, but you need to know the formation of the carboxylic acid and the amine from the cyanohydrin. So that brings us to the next reaction, excuse me. And this is the second to last reaction that's new in this chapter. And like I told you before we went to break, the Wittig reaction, so discovered by a German chemist by the name of Georg Wittig, um, he won the Nobel Prize for this in 1979. And it's an important reaction in organic chemistry. Why? Because you make carbon-carbon bonds, right? You can modify a carbon skeleton. And I've told you many times that one of the surefire ways to get a Nobel Prize in chemistry is to design a reaction where you make a carbon-carbon bond. It'll always make you famous. And so what happens is we end up taking a ketone or an aldehyde, either one, that's why it's in this chapter, and then we convert one of those, either one, into an alkene. So you're taking a ketone or aldehyde and you're making an alkene out of it. And if you remember way back in organic chemistry one, um, if you took it with me or at UCCS, that would be chapter eight in our textbook. And we learned a million reactions, not a million, but we learned a bunch of reactions that can be done with alkenes. And so you can see why this is such great chemistry. Not only do you form a new carbon-carbon bond, right? We have a new bond between this carbon and this carbon. But we produce an alkene, and there's many things you can do with an alkene. 
So what happens is we take our carbonyl compound and we react it with what is literally called a Wittig, a Wittig reagent. Reagent. So that's what this thing is here. That's the Wittig reagent. And this, we call this an illid, where you have a positive charge on the sulfur, uh, sorry, a positive charge on the phosphorus, negative charge on the, on the carbon. And if you're wondering, why is it drawn like this? Like, why don't they put a double bond here instead and get rid of this lone pair? There's a good reason for that, and I'll get into that in just a second Roo, here. So if we take a look at this Wittig reagent, okay, we call this form here, we call this the illid. And then we call this form here the ilene. And you can see that they're just, you know, resonance contributors to the hybrid. And again, if you're wondering, well, why, why are you drawing it like this when here there's no formal charges? I thought a structure where there's no formal charges would be uh, preferred. I'll tell you what, man, you can draw it this way anytime you want. The reason why chemists will usually draw it this way is because... A pi bond between a carbon and a phosphorus is, is kind of a crummy thing. Because if you think about, you know, the p orbital on the carbon is a 2p orbital, right? But the p orbital on the phosphorus is a 3p orbital. So they actually don't overlap all that well. Their overlap is really terrible. And so that's why we preferred to draw it as the ilid versus the ilene. Again, for the mechanism, I don't care. You can draw either way you want. Either way, you're going to get the right answer if you draw the mechanism correctly because you start out with what we call a two plus two cycloaddition. The two atoms from the ilid or the ilene, so the carbon and the phosphorus, and then the carbon and the oxygen from your carbonyl of your aldehyde and or, or, um, or ketone. So see what I mean here? So we take our ilid form here, and this is the two plus two cycloaddition, right? Two atoms plus two atoms, and it's a concerted mechanism, two arrows at the exact same time. And if you're looking at this and going, well, you're going to make a four-membered ring. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And we call that ring an oxophosphatane. So this thing here, we call that an oxophosphatane. Now, what's interesting with the oxophosphatane is it can undergo a fragmentation to give you an alkene. Okay, so we end up producing an alkene, and that comes from kind of this part of the mechanism right here, right? That's where we get the alkene from, okay? And the rest produces this molecule here. This is called triphenylphosphine oxide. So we abbreviate it TPPO, triphenylphosphine oxide. And the thing about triphenylphosphine oxide is that it is what drives the reaction forward. Look down here. It says the especially stable triphenylphosphine oxide is what drives the reaction forward, right? You're making something that's so thermodynamically stable that it pushes the reaction forward. If you're wondering, do I have to know this mechanism? Oh, you bet your bobby socks you do, okay? Wittig mechanism, one of the most important mechanisms that we study in chemistry 3111. So um, now something that you're routinely asked to do on ACS exams, my quizzes, DAT, MCAT, any kind of organic chemistry exam is come up with or build your Wittig reagent. Okay, you have to make the ilid or the ilene yourself. And a lot of times it'll ask, well, how would you make this compound by using a Wittig approach? You know, which, which part of the molecule would you make the ilene from or the ilid, ilid from? And so you have to understand what's going on on this slide in order to be able to do that. So let's take a look at it. It says, in order to make a Wittig reagent, it takes two steps. Okay, isn't that a Leonard Skinner song? Give me two steps to make a Wittig reagent. No, I think it's give me three steps. Anyhow, but we have two steps. So the first step is going to be a reaction between an alkyl halide and triphenylphosphine. Okay. So that's this little guy here. This is triphenylphosphine. Okay, that acts as a nucleophile. It does an SN2 on your alkyl halide, and you end up with this intermediate that we call a phosphonium salt. Okay, a phosphonium salt. In the second step, you treat it with butylithium. Now remember, butylithium is a very, very, very strong base. It's a carbanion. It's one of the strongest bases there is. And so it removes a proton from the carbon to make your Wittig reagent. Again, this is called the ilid form, the ilid, and the one with the double bond is called the ilene form, like that. Now, if you're trying to decide how should I make my Wittig reagent, the key is this. The first step is an SN2 substitution. What kind of substrates work best in an SN2? We know that it's methyl or primary halides. Methyl here, 
methyl or primary halides. We know that secondary don't work very well and tertiary, they don't work at all. And so when you're looking at your alkene and saying, I would like to make this by using Wittig chemistry, you've got to choose wisely as to which side you wanna make the Wittig reagent from. Again, it's a question they love to ask on exams. Now we're gonna take a look at an example of that. Before we do, let's get a little more background on this Wittig chemistry because you might be wondering, well, hold on, you told me that we're gonna make an alkene, okay, like this. What if it's, uh, you know, what if there's a, a st possible for stereoisomers? What if I can get two diastereomers? Am I gonna get the E or the Z product? Well, that would be a great question. And the answer is this, the Wittig reaction is, as a matter of fact, stereoselective, okay? So stereoselective for E versus Z. Which one are you going to get? And it says here that if you use some kind of simple alkyl halide, Okay, and if you're wondering, like, what do you mean by simple? Okay, well, it'll become more abundantly clear when I show you something that will give you the E product. Anyhow, if you just use a simple alkyl halide, and this Wittig here, this would have come from ethyl iodide. So I'll just write here CH3, CH2I. So it comes from a, um, uh, uh, a simple alkyl halide, just a primary alkyl halide. We end up with the Z product. Okay, Z product in this case. However, if your Wittig reagent, if you can draw a resonance structure where you can where it shows stabilization of the ilid. So if you have some kind of electron withdrawing group or aromatic ring, aromatic ring. Okay, so I'm gonna put all this together. If you have that, so here we have an electron withdrawing group, right? This is an EWG. And then here we have an aromatic ring. Aromatic, and that's those are both part of our Wittig reagent. In that case, you get the E alkene. Now, the book goes into drawing the resonance structures of these, but at this point, I'm expecting you to be able to draw resonance structures without my guidance. That you should be able to do that by now. So, if you need to take a look at that in the book, make sure you understand um, the um, how to draw the resonance forms of these. So, um, it says here if the Wittig reagent contains an electron withdrawing group or aromatic ring, so let's pencil that in again, or aromatic ring, um, you get the E alkene, okay? Now it says here, an electron withdrawing gro group or a phenyl ring delocalizes the anionic charge and stabilizes the Wittig reagent. So we have a variation of the Wittig reaction. We call it the Horner-Wadsworth-Emmons reaction. Gee, every, everybody get their name on this thing. Okay, the Horner Wadsworth Emmons or the HWE reaction employs a reagent that's kind of like a stabilized ilid. And so it always gives you E alkenes. Any kind of stabilized, um, you know, Wittig looking reagent is going to give you um, a, uh, an E alkene. So here's a stabilized Wittig. Again, you should be able to draw, son of a gun, you should be able to draw the resonance arrows like this. I would expect you to be able to do that. And then here you can do the same thing with the Horner Wadsworth Emmons. Um, reagent, which is just what we call a um, phosphonate ester. So this part here, this is called a phosphonate ester. This is obviously an ester. Anyhow, so we have our phosphonate ester, um, which is also resonance stabilized here too, right? So it's doubly resonance stabilized. Anyhow, so when we use the Horner-Wadsworth-Emmons, again, we get the E product, just like we would get with a stabilized Wittig. Now, if you're wondering, oh, man, what's the explanation for that? That is something that we actually don't cover in this class at all. I will leave that up to you if you want to look into it. Be my guest. It is well understood, but it is not covered in our textbook, not even a little bit. Okay, if you take organic chemistry for chemistry majors, they go into some of the details about this, but, um, you know, it's nothing that's covered at this level. Okay, so I'll leave that up to you if you're interested. Otherwise, you just kind of have to know. Simple alkyl halide gives you the Z product. Anything that's stabilized gives you the E product. And again, we don't ask you for any explanation of that. Now, if you're wondering, what would you ask me? Like I said, this is a great ACS question. I've seen this on the ACS exam. I've seen this in MCAT study materials. I've seen this in DAT study materials. I've seen this in PCAT study materials. They all love this question. If you have an alkene, just some simple alkene here, you know, what is this, this is what, 2-methyl-1-butene. What's the best way to make this compound via a Wittig reagent? 
right? Or via vitigre action, okay? So would you make your vitigre agent, you know, from this side? So would you make it from the CH2 group that's shown here, this CH2 group, and put your um, triphenylphosphine attached to it? Or would you make it from this side of the molecule here, right? And put the vitigre agent over here. Well, hopefully you can see which route is better because if we look at the retrosynthesis of the two vitigre agents, this is going to come from a reaction between a methyl halide and triphenylphosphine, right? It's gonna come from an SN2 between those two. And the other route is gonna come from an SN2 between what? Between two iodobutane, for example, and triphenylphosphine. So if I call this route A and I call this one B, which one of these is a more efficacious route? Which one's gonna give me a higher yield, A or B? And it's not meant to be a, something to fool you. I guess I could have called it route one. <laughs> Anybody have an idea, right? Which one of these is gonna give you a better SN2 yield, A or B? It's gonna be A, right, by a long shot, right? Because this is a methyl halide, right? So there's your SN2. Right, whereas this one, it's on a secondary alkyl halide, right? Secondary versus methyl. Well, a methyl halide is going to react much faster in an SN2 than a secondary alkyl halide. And so we would pick the methyl halide, right? Because it's going to give you a faster reaction, better reaction in an SN2 with a methyl halide over a secondary. So there you go. So this would be our reaction. The first thing now, follow along with me very carefully here because I'm going to draw the mechanism out, okay? So we're going to start out with our methyl iodide, okay? And we're going to treat that with triphenylphosphine. So the phosphorus has a lone pair and three bonds. It's in the same group as nitrogen. So you're going to do your SN2, nucleophilic attack, and loss of leaving group. That's going to give you this compound, CH3. Um, pH3 like this, but the phosphorus is going to have a positive charge. All right, so now we need to make our ILID or our vitig region. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put CH2 and I'm going to draw one of the hydrogens because I'm going to need it in my mechanism here. So I'm going to take butyl lithium. So I'll just draw the butyl lithium carbanion like that. Okay, and that's going to rip off this proton. Okay, like this, and that's going to make my ILID. So now I've got CH2. It's got a lone pair, a negative charge. It's attached to a phosphorus with four bonds, which has a positive charge. So this is the resonance form of the iline. I'm just going to draw it this way. Okay, and now we have our two plus two cycloaddition. So what's going to happen is the negative charge on the carbon is going to be attracted towards the um, electrophilic center in the carbonyl. Okay, and then this pi bond is going to form a bond to the phosphorus like this, and that's going to make our oxophosphatine. So let's draw the oxophosphatine. We've got our carbon. It's got two hydrogens attached to it down here. We have our phosphorus, which has one, two, three phenyl groups attached to it. I'm just drawing them all out now. It's also attached to an oxygen, and then this carbon which has a methyl group and an ethyl group attached to it. So there's our oxophosphatine right there. Now remember the driving force was not the formation of the alkene, but the formation of this compound, triphenylphosphine oxide. And so this oxophosphatine is gonna undergo a fragmentation like this. And you can see that what I made on this part right here is this compound. That's the alkene that you get and then the other part, which is here, gives you the triphenylphosphine oxide. All right, will you have to practice this on your own? Yes, absolutely. Is this an important mechanism for you to know? Oh, you bet your Bobby socks it is. Okay, so I'm gonna put a star by that very important mechanism. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some green yard chemistry here. So now we're gonna kind of back up and we're gonna do a little review of all of section 19.10. So we've got some questions here about green yard. We've got some questions here about cyanohydrins. Another one about cyanohydrins. Then we get some vitig questions here. 
another vetted question here, and then we get into the very last section. So we got quite a few problems to solve here. There's quite a few. So let's start with the first ones and let's muscle our way through some of these. And we'll start with this first one. You notice that we have ethyl magnesium bromide and phenyl magnesium bromide as reagents here. So what is this question dealing with? This question is about green yard chemistry, right? And again, we covered this in chapter 12. So it's covered in chapter 12 and 19. And so we have a reaction between a ketone and ethyl magnesium bromide followed by treatment with water. And you could write H3O plus here. I would accept that too. Same thing here for H3O plus, H3O plus. So let's draw a little mechanism here. Our ethyl carbanion, you don't have to draw the cation, I don't care. But that's gonna do a nucleophilic attack on our carbonyl. We're gonna end up with chiral center being formed in this case. So we end up with, no, sorry, it's not a chiral center, my mistake. We end up with this guy, which has got a negative charge. And then in the next step, we treat it with our H3O plus. We do a proton transfer, and we end up with a tertiary alcohol, which looks like this. Remember that pH represents the aromatic ring. It's just a, a shorthand version of it. The next one, we have benzaldehyde, and we're treating it with phenyl magnesium bromide. Same rationale. We have our phenyl carbanion. It's going to do a nucleo nucleophilic attack like this. We end up with this intermediate, which is going to look something like this. So we've got one hydrogen, then we've got our aromatic ring, then we have the negative charge on our oxygen. They're, we're going to treat this with H, H3O plus, and that is going to give us the alcohol. So we have phenyl H alcohol. If you didn't draw that hydrogen in, if you just drew this, um, this is the same thing, okay? These two compounds that I've drawn here at the end, these are identical. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the two green yards. Any questions about those? I didn't want to spend too much time on those because we've done green yard chemistry already. Cool, cool. Well, let's move on to something else that involves more green yard chemistry. So if we want to go from a compound that has five carbons to a compound that has six carbons. So we're going from an alcohol and we want to add a methyl group to it. So we're making a carbon-carbon bond here. So we could do this by a green yard. If we had cyclopentanone, all we'd have to do is treat that with methyl magnesium bromide, and that would give us the product. Could anybody tell me how I could convert this alcohol, cyclopentanol, into cyclopentanone? Anybody have a favorite? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tiana. PCC, I like it. There we go. And so in the last part, we're going to treat this with methyl magnesium bromide in the first step. And in the second step, we'll treat it with H3O+. And that's going to give us the desired product. There you go. All right. The next one is in the exact same vein. You would want to oxidize this alcohol to an aldehyde. So you would use PCC. And then you want to add this one methyl group here. So you'd use methyl magnesium bromide. And then in the last step, you'd use aqueous acid. Pretty similar to the first one. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. Again, these are both green yard questions, right? And, and oxidation, I guess. Green yard slash, slash oxidation. Okay. Let's take a look at this one here. So it says identify the reagents that could be used. Well, that's not really what it's asking here. It's just it should be just draw product. How about, how about we do that? All right. So what kind of functional group am I going to get? If I treat an aldehyde with KCN and HCl, does anybody remember the name of that, that functional group? I don't care if you spell it correctly. Yep, exactly. Cyanohydrin. Perfect. Thanks, Jalen. So we're going to make a cyanohydrin. And if you remember, the cyanohydrin was a carbon that had a hydroxyl and a cyano group on it, right? It had both of those functionalities on it. And then in the next step, if we treat it with H3O plus and cook it up, okay? So this is after step one. Maybe I should put this in red then. Okay, so then in the second step, if I treat that with H3O plus and heat, what that does is it converts the nitrile. So where's my pen? 
it converts the nitrile into a carboxylic acid. So we have our hydroxyl, and then this gets converted into a carboxyl. Like that. There you go, kind of a neat, um, a neat problem. By the way, you know, I showed you that you could take this and treat it with LAH and then water, and it would convert would convert this um, to, to the amine like this. I don't know if you remember that or not. We just looked at it a few minutes ago. Um, later on, we use a reaction kind of like this to make, a, to make an amino acid. But anyhow, that's, I'm getting way ahead of myself. That's in another chapter. All right, let's take a look at the next one. The next one involves cyanohydrin chemistry as well. Here we have a carbon that has a hydroxyl and a carboxyl group on it. So we know that that came from, that came from a cyanohydrin. So we had a hydroxyl and a nitrile here. And so that is going to come from the ketone, right? And so how do we get from here to here, right? The first step is going to be PCC or SWERN or desmartin periodinane. The second step is going to be KCN and HCl to make our cyanohydrin. And the third step is just going to be cook it up in acid. So H3O plus and heat it up. We'll just write here H3O plus and heat. Okay. Same thing with the next one. This comes from a cyanohydrin. It comes from the same cyanohydrin, as a matter of fact. So it comes from this same old cyanohydrin. And then that's going to come from the carbonyl compound. So the first two steps are going to be identical. First, we oxidize, then we make the cyanohydrin. And then in the last part, we need two steps to make the amine. The first step is going to be lithium aluminum hydride. And then in the last step in four, I would accept H2O or H3O plus. Either one is fine with this guy, and that's going to give you the final product. All right, now we're doing some Wittig chemistry, right? Some Wittig reactions here. And you can see that this one here is the horner wadsworth Emmons, right? So with the first one, we're gonna get an E compound, but there's no E or Z in here because this is a symmetrical ketone. So you get a couple of options here, but here's, do you want me to show you the easiest way to do this? It's this, okay? Draw the carbon of the carbonyl, okay? And then draw the carbon that's attached with the double bond to the phosphorus. Now in your product, all you have to do is draw a double bond between the red carbon and the blue carbon, and you're done. That's it. So you're going to do this. One, two, three, four, five. Here's your blue carbon. Draw a double bond to the red carbon. And it's got one, two. So it's got, you got um, one, two, oops. Done. That's it. That's the whole thing. There's nothing more to it than that. And here there's no E or Z. Now, keep in mind, we don't want to keep a blue and a red carbon in there, so we would just leave the bond line structure like that. Does anybody remember when we use a stabilized illid? Right? And this is the horner wadsworth Emmons variation, right? So do we get the E or the Z product in this case? Does anybody remember? Yeah, thanks, Deanna. You get the E product. Exactly, exactly. All right, so again, it's the same rationale here. If you're wondering, you know, how do I do this? Okay, same old thing. Look, take this carbon, label it in, in red, and take the carbon with the negative charge, label it in, in blue, like that. Now you make a double bond between those two carbons, and you're going to lose all of this portion. Okay, so let me just put here, this portion here is going to be lost. And then this portion here has to be um, has to be E, right? Because it's the bigger part. Okay. So what's our final product going to look like? We're going to have our methyl group like this. We have our double bond, right? This is our red carbon. This is our blue carbon. And like Tiana said, we're going to get the E product. And so we're going to draw our ester group over here. And that's it, man. We end up with the E. Why? Because again, this is a stabilized, stabilized um, reagent. Here you go. So a little bit of um, um, Grignard, or sorry, um, 
Vidig. Sorry, I got my reactions mixed up here. And so now I'd like to try, let's try A together, okay? Because there's kind of two ways that we could do A, right? We could either start with this carbonyl, okay? And we could have um, this uh, phosphonate. So where we have pH three, P double bond one, how many carbons? One, two, three, one, two, three. Like that, that's one possibility. Or the other possibility would be this, would be to have, um, hmm, 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 where we have our double bond, PPH3, plus this aldehyde is what you'd be starting off with. Okay, let me make that double bond a little cleaner. So you've got the blue pathway or the red pathway. Only one of these is, or one of these is clearly better than the other. Could anybody tell me which one it would be? Would it be the blue pathway or the red pathway? Remember, there's an SN2 reaction to make the, the Wittig reagent, which I've drawn as the ilene here, instead of the ilid. Does anybody have an idea which pathway would be better? Yeah, it's going to be the blue one, isn't it? Right, why would that be? It's because the blue uh, compound, the blue ilid, is going to come from this and one, two, three, it's not very pretty. Let me fix it up here. It's going to come from this, right? It's going to come from a primary alkyl halide. This is primary. Over here, the Wittig reagent is going to come from this, a secondary alkyl halide and triphenylphosphine, right? They both do an SN2 reaction, right? Nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group. Same thing here, nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group. But an SN2, on a primary alkyl halide is going to be way better. And so we're going to choose the blue pathway. Give me a thumbs up if that makes some sense to you. Cha? Okay. All right. So what I would like you to do then, so we're going to take another break now. I want you to try to write out the whole sequence, starting from triphenylphosphine and the alkyl halide. Make sure you incorporate um, uh, butylithium and everything. So I want you to try A to finish it. And I want you to try B. Now notice that B is symmetrical. So there's only one possible pathway there. And then after we come back, we're going to do those two problems or finish up A and we're going to do B. And then we're going to move into the very last reaction of the chapter, which is the bayer villiger oxidation reaction, where you learn about migratory aptitude. And then after that, we're going to get into practicing uh, putting all this chemistry to work, you know, into some synthesis problems. So. Again, let's take a short break, and I'd like everybody to give these their best effort, uh, because again, uh, you know, like I said multiple times today, video chemistry is one of the classics, okay? It's one of the most widely asked questions on any kind of standardized exam. So only one thing that I can think of that's more important in terms of mechanisms, and that's Fischer esterification, and we haven't covered that yet. So we'll cover that in the next chapter.